Um, our next presenter is Jane Berth uh, James Berthody. Uh, James uh, has over 10 years of experience in DevOps and security engineering. Uh, he was an early adopter of cloud native security tech from startups to enterprise and, and used that experience to build uh, Latio Tech, an engineering uh, firm, focused uh, analysis firm, excuse me, for understanding emerging security technologies. And uh, James, we're looking forward to listening and learning about um, your presentation, The Evolution of Cloud Detection and Response. It's all yours, James. Thanks. Uh, hey, everyone. If you don't know me, uh, my name is James. As Gary mentioned, a lot of my backgrounds from the DevOps side into security. Um, and so I have a lot of early experience in Kubernetes and the evolving nature of cloud security. And a lot of that allows me to do this fun, uh, no BS historical work on how some of these things evolved and some of the challenges that happened over the course of it. And so today we're going to be talking about how cloud detection and response has evolved uh, starting early on when things were like, what is a CSPM? What do we do with these tools? How do we understand the cloud? to now today, uh, what I'm arguing for is the convergence of application and cloud security ultimately into this runtime oriented tool. Um, and so a lot of this initial framework that we're talking about starts with uh, the SOC, right? And security operations is probably the backbone of security. And really, I think the cloud, what I would argue was such a major shift in all of this, that ultimately it, it really is what led to uh, security creating whole new teams, whether it's cloud security teams, product security, application security. Um, application security always existed at large enterprises that could afford it. So places like Microsoft and uh, Meta, all of the FANG companies. Um, but as that has trickled down with cloud, uh, really all of a sudden we were lift and shifting our existing infrastructure into the cloud and the security tools were coming with it. And so this is like the first era of cloud security is shifting our Windows infrastructure into the cloud and realizing, well, now we're paying a lot more for it, first of all, um, but also trying to understand how do our existing security tools work in this new environment. And I think uh, this is the, the recognition of the need for new tooling in the cloud is really what drove a lot of the existing players that we're seeing now in CNAP, like most prominently like uh, Palo Alto, getting into the CNAP game with the Prisma Cloud acquisitions was a recognition that, you know, having a Palo Alto firewall, for example, in the cloud, first of all, it's not as common of a cloud architecture anymore to be using firewalls uh, in this traditional way. Um, but beyond that, there's an, a recognition that just the old firewall plus EDR stack is no longer uh, what we need to do security effectively in the cloud. And that took a long time uh, for people to learn and recognize. And ultimately, um, I think that starts with Linux adoption. And if you look up uh, CNCF, uh, has a lot of great statistics on the trends of Linux adoption, of container adoption uh, into the cloud, where the vast, vast majority of application workloads that run on the cloud are running using Linux. And this shift uh, was really hard for security operations, at least from uh, the kinds of places I was working at, I was at an MDR provider. And, you know, so we worked with a lot of different enterprises and fundamentally all of our existing teams were really well trained on this windows architecture. So whether that was like domain controllers and looking for different active directory exploits or looking for different Kerberos exploits with uh, windows ex uh, endpoints and laptops, right? This was sort of the bread and butter of a lot of operations teams. And all of a sudden you have layers of new technology uh, getting shoved into that operation stack. And so all of a sudden, it's not just the Windows environment, but it's the Linux environment where we're learning how, uh, where security people are having to learn modern development techniques and how uh, things like Nginx servers work, how different Ubuntu things work. And so a lot of this evolution um, is really what drove uh, not just cloud adoption, but how we uh, got to where we are with cloud detection and response. And so at its heart, um, this is also why a lot of the early cloud security tools we saw were really container security tools, because they recognized that lack of visibility into the container layer of the workload, and that that was what security teams really needed in order to uh, tackle this emerging threat. And so really this adoption helps speak to why uh, I think we're just now seeing cloud detection response truly turn into its own category, 
Uh, whereas before early on, um, I think we saw glimpses of this. Like I remember when I first saw uh, what Falco was working on um, and what Sysdig became, um, a, a lot of that early vision uh, was around container security specifically. And I thought it was gonna like take over everything. And that adoption has just been slower than I anticipated because of the nature of big enterprises who are adopting this technology, but it's happening more slowly and in a more regulated way. Um, and so security teams are sort of making this shift. And so if we look at sort of the evolution of these different tools across uh, the cloud into the workload, I think this diagram is super helpful for when I talk about like the convergence of cloud detection response with application detection response and all of these different technologies, it's really helpful to get an idea for how web applications work in the cloud. And so I just wanna spend a minute first talking about uh, this diagram down here. Um, where first we had EDR existing on the host, right? This is that first layer of Windows environments primarily getting shifted to the cloud. And this is where something like CrowdStrike or Sentinel One as the two biggest ones were running on your host. And that's something that you are probably doing first and foremost. But if you ever ran those on a Linux host, especially early on, things have gotten a little bit better since then, you quickly saw the gaps as these tools basically fell apart. I mean, I remember helping people uh, pass audits by saying that uh, if workloads are are Linux based, then the odds of an exploit are lower than a Windows uh, host, and so you don't need runtime protection on it. Like these were very common things that I saw in different audit reports uh, across different, whether it was SOC two or other attestations. Um, all of this initial development around EDR, specifically that Windows to Linux shift, necessitated what came next, which was CWPP. And so that was Cloud Workload Protection Platform. And that was a recognition that, hey, this CSPM stuff um, exists at the cloud layer, but we need something now that can work better for Linux and more specifically for containerized workloads. And this is where we saw early Twistlock uh, adoption, Falco alongside it. Like those early container security tools were the evolution of trying to bring this EDR concept into container and Linux workloads. And then when you layer into that CSPM, um, this was the big debate uh, that no one could have really known at the outset was like, if security teams would more widely adopt agent-based or agentless solutions for monitoring their cloud for security issues. Now, in my opinion, it's unfortunate that a lot of early uh, security adoption was specifically around this idea of uh, we just want to get visibility into our uh, general cloud uh, architecture and we want to look for misconfigurations and vulnerabilities and that got prioritized over any runtime capabilities because a lot of this was just about security teams learning uh, the architecture of their cloud environment and so over time this agentless CSPM approach would slowly start adopting agent-based uh, detections to get more runtimey but alongside that, we see some early CDR. Uh, there's a clear example of this with like guard duty alerts uh, in AWS, where someone logs in from a new a new location where they've never logged into before. That triggers an alert, right? That's an early cloud alert because it's looking at the cloud trail logs to trigger some of those detections. And so you have CSPM in this early CDR, which is just doing some very basic log cloud log based detection. And all of these technologies sort of get grouped into CMAP. And that's what uh, we have now as, as the primary like general gigantic category that we uh, use for sorting through some of this stuff. And so uh, part of this transition, transition into CMAP meant that a lot of different places of emphasis were missed along the way. And so I think a lot of CMAPs at this point just don't have very good workload protection, which was the goal that we were getting at with detection response in the first place. But then we notice there's especially more and more emphasis now happening on these two layers of the application that have been largely forgotten. And I'm going to talk about this in the future trends section of like what's being done to sort of loop these things in. Um, but within the containerized workload, there was still just this extension of like, we're going to look at processes and file interactions, and that's going to be our primary detection mechanism. Um, but there's still within that container, there's still your application, which is usually some kind of binary um, getting loaded onto the container that's actually getting executed or um, or if it's an interpreted language, just like a Python script that is getting executed and, and serving network traffic in some way. 
And these two uh, layers are more and more getting reached into by more modern uh, detection response tools that are really trying to tie this whole picture together. And again, I'll talk about sort of how they're they're doing it here. Um, but really this, uh, this adoption now, to talk about it more from a um, practitioner point of view, really each one of these categories led to different mechanisms as the SOC started getting some of this new telemetry and some of these new alerting structures. So first it was just do it yourself with a SIM. And so a lot of companies just started ingesting CloudTrail logs, maybe VPC flow logs, uh, sometimes Kubernetes audit logs. Those were typically some of the first log sources that people were looking at building their own detections around. And really this was immediately uh, pretty limited in scope. And I remember dealing with a lot of these frustrations myself where you'll get an alert um, that like a, a something's been misconfigured or someone logged in from an unknown location, but then you don't have like the rest of their session. Like, okay, well, someone's maybe stole credentials, but then what did they do? What workload did they hit? Or maybe you have um, an alert specifically around the, the workload layer, but you miss other pieces of the context of what happened within the cloud. And this is what early CNAP detections really tried to look at. And unfortunately, I think most large CNAP companies still really never integrated uh, these two things in any meaningful way, where you sort of have this like workload uh, alert generation thing, and then you have this cloud control plane alert generation thing. And it's only, I think, very recently that we're starting to see people tie those things together to actually make this information usable for security operations teams. And really, I think that's the heart of what uh, modern cloud detection response is all about is how do we make this information usable to security operations teams who are not developers for the most part? And I think there's a good parallel here with uh, how we've managed to build security tooling for Windows users, just as an example, where uh, a first year SOC analyst, and I've worked with a lot of those, uh, it's not like they're Windows developers, right? But the tooling that they have makes them feel very powerful within a Windows environment where they can quarantine files, kill processes, run, uh, different traces and look at artifacts and uh, do forensics to, to a light extent, where really they've got this power over Windows environments uh, that they've never had before, where they're learning how they work at the same time that they're on the job doing the analyst work. And I think now this is more and more the vision that uh, people have when it comes to how do we how do we operationalize this information for the cloud? And I'm just going to open the chat here in case I'm missing anything. Cool. Um, so I think more and more, this is what the goal of, of cloud detection response is, is how do we make this information usable to someone? And honestly, the challenge is a lot harder, right? Like I still consistently meet with security people who just refuse to learn Kubernetes. And whether that's right or wrong, like the answer is Kubernetes is really, really complicated. And it's not the kind of thing that you can just learn in two seconds, right? Um, and this is the kind of uh, operational control that we we really want people to have over time is getting that full visibility. And uh, Alex, to answer your question, I'll go ahead and just hop back one slide. I include the ADR and NDR in here as uh, that WAF API security being woven in. Um, this it, ADR is really interesting because we see a lot of people getting into this category now um, from the API security side and from the eBPF side or the, the agent base side. And it's because you can technically get the same information with either approach. And I think over time, uh, CNAP is going, CNAP, uh, CNAP really bothers me as a category because the goal of CNAP is to just be like the everything security platform. And I think it goes back to like, we would have never said like, we're a data center security platform, but that's all the cloud is, is a hosted data center. And so this idea that like I'm going to have one platform that literally does every single thing uh, related to security is always going to be, uh, it, even if it exists from a feature standpoint, it's never going to be fun to use or it's never going to be something that I enjoy using because it's trying to serve too many different security personas, right? Like in an on-prem world, this is the network team, this is the development team, this is the infrastructure team, like those different teams want different things out of a tool. And so that's why I'm I, in general, like, yes, CNAP is going to try to like widen this box to include everything because like that's the goal of CNAP. 
But really, I think the detection response emphasis is what most clearly separates it from, um, from the rest of scanning as a whole because those operational alerts are really meant to give you like maximal context around an alert that's happening. And so just to, to go on what you said about platform platformatization, um, I do think platforms exist, but I think it should be separated between uh, the scanning and the runtime, or as what Ben suggested earlier, really allowing those two things to inform each other more than we've seen in the past, right? And so that's a lot of like the ARMO approach is how do we use this runtime data to inform the posture findings that we're getting to make it so that the entire thing is oriented around an actual end user who can benefit from it. And not just this like abstract list of features that just sort of goes on and on and on and on. Um, I was unfortunate enough to use uh, the early version of Prisma Cloud that still said uh, uh, microservice API segmentation as a feature. And like that's a really long time ago. And there's a reason that those features sort of like come and go over time uh, with some of these major providers is because they're just sort of adding and removing them as they think people are interested in, in them, but there's not like this clear cohesive vision of the problem we're trying to solve. And so that's why I love cloud detection and response is it's actually trying to solve a real problem, which is there are attackers in my cloud environment. What do I do to stop and get them out or to um, try to actually do something about this attack that's happening? And it's a, it's a clear shift in my mind from the early CSPM days, which were purely around like there's a misconfiguration. And so that's why I highlight this attempts at agentless CDR. Um, there's a few different approaches that are out there for like how might, what would a CDR look like that's agentless? Um, but just in my opinion, I think the a lot of the value um, that can come with detection response really requires an agent. Because if you go back uh, to this diagram of what a workload looks like, um, if you don't have an agent, you only have access to this layer and not even really the container layer. Like you can see uh, what containers exist, but you can't actually see what they're doing without an agent. And so that's why in order to do detection response properly, if it's to tell this, if the goal of detection response is to tell this entire exploit story to an end user, in my mind, you really clearly need the agent to get that visibility into the workload, um, which is where eBPF comes in. And I'll talk about the future trends with this in a minute, but eBPF really is a total game changer. And I want to make sure that I'm really careful in how I describe what it does for a runtime detection response in the cloud. And it's because eBPF is purely a way to interact with Linux systems and get a ton of visibility um, at a very low operational cost. And the, the problem with eBPF from a marketing standpoint is at this point, almost every CNAP uh, has an eBPF agent and they'll just tell you, you know, hey, we have an eBPF agent, congratulations. But if you just think of eBPF, and I have a video of this on my channel, it, it you're, you're basically just writing C programs uh, almost from scratch. And there's almost no like well-defined, here's how an eBPF program should look. It is like the wild west right now which is why uh, if you're looking for a new career opportunity to switch into, uh, eBPF engineering is a great way to go at the moment. Um, because first of all, it's super low level and, and it's a difficult skill to find. Um, but also again, like there really is uh, a green field here as far as like the specific implementations that are happening of eBPF are all wildly different. And so while something like uh, Falco or Tracy, um, Falco, Sysdig and Tracy's Aqua, those have existed for longer. Um, than other eBPF solutions, but that doesn't automatically make them better because this entire framework is super customized um, and really initial starting architectures from what I've seen can have wildly different outcomes on what they can do, especially based on like which layer of the application they're really getting into. So let's use that to talk about some of the emerging trends that are happening within cloud detection response and some of the cool new stuff to look at. And the first thing is these anomaly detection engines or what's sometimes called signature lists. Um, generally, uh, when you first say anomaly detection to me, uh, as a security engineer, the first thing I usually hear is noise um, or super noisy detections because uh, especially in API security, I never used a dedicated API security provider 
But what I've always heard from practitioners who use them is like they are super noisy and uh, crazy to try to manage. And in the same way, like if you just turn on, if imagine you're making a bad anomaly detection engine, you've got a container that makes like 100 syscalls and you are like, every time a new syscall is happening, you're triggering an alert. Like that's going to obviously be a huge missed opportunity. And Ben alluded to this a little bit when we talked about like the training window and what's the right amount of time to train uh, a model on for the container. Um, those are tough questions to answer, but I'm seeing more and more advanced correlation engines happen around detection response, where it's not that every alert is treated as though it's an incident, but really it's rolling up multiple of these things into a single storyline that's saying, hey, maybe if a new syscall happens, that's not like that is different. Um, but we're going to keep watching to see if a bunch of new differences happen. So if we see like a new syscall followed by outbound network activity to a new IP, those two signals together have a much higher indication like, oh, there's an incident probably happening and not just like the application did something different than it usually does. And it's a lot of this evolution of anomaly detection for containers, I, I'm more and more convinced is going to be a huge uh, area of benefit for teams. And I think one small example of this is that it's a little bit of what Twistlock was doing before the Palo Alto acquisition. And that tool has managed to be like surprisingly good at runtime detection in large part because of this small feature that I think has gone like neglected over time. Like I'm not saying it's the world's best anomaly detection engine, but it managed to keep, keep Twistlock a relevant runtime protection tool because of it. And so I think more and more that people who invest in this sort of uh, detection methodology, as long as they can tune the noise out sufficiently, um, is going to be really helpful for noticing emergent threats. And we really see this with the nature of exploits, especially in the cloud in zero days, where every uh, week or two, there's some massive uh, potential supply chain vulnerability. And the exploits are super, super complicated and nerdy uh, to try to get around. And the only fix is to try to actually like run a patch. And um, to try to patch something at scale in an enterprise can take, like at you're really lucky if you can get something done in a single sprint, which is usually two weeks. And that would be like an insane patching cadence to be able to match. And it's the kind of thing we would try to do for some big zero days. Um, but you need something that can detect in the meantime and provide some kind of response in the meantime. And I think more and more of, as we look at like the CVE backlogs, the different exploit backlogs, how hard it is to actually get visibility into what exploits are happening. These anomaly detection engines will allow for more accurate detections of novel exploits as both like chat GPT makes it easier for attackers to learn how to like do complicated exploits um, as well as just people getting backlogged and trying to even disclose uh, some of their new vulnerabilities. So that's the anomaly detection engine piece that I think is going to continue to evolve. Um, next is this application layer visibility. This is probably the, the newest area um, of eBPF engineering specifically to use it to get into uh, the client level or into the application layer visibility with looking at function executions. Um, but there's other approaches that are out there too. Like we talked about with the API security stuff. Some people are looking at distributed tracing. Like there are many different technological approaches to getting this visibility. But what matters is that the goal of the operations team is becoming less like cloud focused detection response and more how do we protect the entire application, which is hosted in this cloud environment. And so the main thing that I'm emphasizing is that it's about, it's shifting from how do I protect like this host to how do I protect my application? And I think that shift is nothing but good for the industry because application exploits continue to grow in their prevalence. Your application is usually what's processing your sensitive data. It's usually the most public facing asset you have. And so for all of those reasons, I'm just glad that runtime application security is getting more achievable for people. Um, and I can do a whole talk about RASP versus ADR, but I will save that for a different time. Uh, third future trend that's happening is this code to cloud correlation. And that's a lot of what Ben was showing within Armo. It's showing like, here's this runtime alert that's happening. And then here's the YAML change you can make to prevent it in the infrastructure as code. And so again, there's a lot of different nuances in what different vendors are doing here. But at the end of the day, people are realizing that to detect and respond, specifically the response part around preventing attacks, uh, to prevent an attack at runtime, you have to make some code change somewhere. 
And those are two different teams with two different expertise. And so how can we unify their experiences together so that a SOC analyst who's never touched a line of code in their life can tell a DevOps person, hey, we need to update this YAML file with this configuration to prevent this exploit that we're seeing at runtime. So it's about unifying those layers so that uh, the entire operations team can have a more seamless experience. Fourth is this preventative policy generation. This is a, a little bit of talking about like set comp profiles. There continues to be evolution in secure by design and what we can do uh, to via policy prevent malicious executions at runtime. And honestly, this is still getting figured out as far as like, how do we make it so that you don't have to tweak these things constantly and we can still allow for a good developer workflow while still locking down those policies to prevent as many attacks as possible. And then finally, the identity workload and cloud detections, again, just moving between all of these different layers. Uh, if someone steals an application credential and it allows them to run an exploit on a workload to then pivot to the cloud, it's unifying that story together. And so all of these trends are really what I see as the future of cloud detection response. And what I'm the most interested in and excited for is how this finally makes it so that to me, the, the, the clear goal is that a SOC analyst doesn't have to like run to the DevOps team anytime any cloud alert happens, which is basically how it works for a lot of places right now, where they'll see some container alert and immediately have to go try to find uh, someone on the DevOps team to help them understand what it is. I think these newer wave of tools are allowing those teams to better communicate and understand each other's worlds um, to allow for more incident response. So that's all I have. Uh, you can feel free to message me on LinkedIn. Uh, is probably where I'm the most active in stuff. Uh, yeah, there's a YouTube channel and newsletter and a site on Lacio to uh, find different security tools is what I do. Well, I mean, other than that, not much going on, huh, James? Yeah. Yeah, that, that was incredible. Um, so, you know, one of the questions uh, that comes to mind is, you know, what should a company do if they're just you know, kind of starting to you know, learn about runtime uh, cloud security? Where does someone start? Yeah, it's definitely an evolving area. Like I'll obviously point to my own newsletter and resources, but uh, essentially it is about going through the process in a hands-on way to instrument some of this stuff yourself and to not be afraid to ask specifically DevOps teams, but other teams in the organization, like how you can be involved in their day-to-day. Uh, cause I think that good security here has to start with like empathy with what other teams are going through. Um, and so it's hard to do cloud security in a silo. You know, that really strikes a uh, home to me because one of the first things that I came to understand in a generalized sense about the cybersecurity ecosystem is that criminals are kind of horizontally structured. You know, they share information so freely, you know, amongst other one another. They have rating systems, you know, for for various types of attack. Um, but the defenders are more vertically structured, you know, because of um, intellectual property or competition or the, the patchwork of, you know, state, you know, uh, federal, global regulatory things like it doesn't seem fair to me, you know. So uh, how do you how do you get around that? How do you? How do you do what you just said, which is to um, empower people to to share and to let go of sort of maybe antiquated ways of thinking about this uh, so that we can compete against the criminals? Yeah, I think that's um, a very difficult issue. I think in general, um, cybersecurity people can be very uh, resistant to learning from vendors a lot of times. And there's some truth to that because there are a lot of like vendor pitches that are buried in different educational pieces. But I think most vendors, especially smaller ones, like have a genuine desire to help people learn and fix this stuff. And it's not, um, you know, buried in a, in a giant sales pitch as part of it. So I think just keeping an eye on like working with emerging vendors in different spaces usually want to genuinely help with whatever issue is happening. Um, and then on the team side, I, again, it's just about being willing to actually horizontally reach out across departments to just try to learn things as opposed to being like the ticket mongerer that's just like sending tickets over the line, uh, asking them to get fixed.
Yeah, I'll copy that. Do you, uh, one of the really interesting questions that just came in is, do you think that cloud uh, network securities, firewalls, and um, WAF and API security should be interwoven with um, CNAP, you know, into the same uh, UI to ensure a layer of protection and prevention of risk in the cloud? Yeah, and this, I touched on this a little bit in the, the presentation around like the the uh, expansion of CNAP, where I think CNAP's definitely going to uh, try to do that. Um, but I don't think that it'll be a good experience for people. And I think that's the balance with all of these big uh, CNAP platforms is they're really trying to uh, grab um, as much of that as possible. Um, and so what I, I think people should stay focused most on the personas and the problems they're trying to solve and like who's going to be the one to solve it. And less like, oh, I have an existing contract with Palo Alto and they say they do cloud security. And so now I now I have their cloud security um, to actually think about like, who's going to be using this? What are they going to be using it for? That sort of thing. Indeed. And, and uh, someone asked or is commenting that there are hundreds of vendors out there in cloud security. And what's your view on that and, and the landscape getting... Uh, complex and what about uh, consolidation kind of in the vendor ecosystem yep that's a uh, uh i just linked my uh latio list site there that tries to help give practitioners advice around those uh different tools and the landscape and what's out there um i think for as um for as many of the vendors as there are there's clear use cases for most of them as far as where they fit into the platform consolidation. Uh, I think more and more of the consolidation that's going to happen is into like persona driven use cases. So the way I think of it is like a tool for the SOC, a tool for developers and a tool for sysadmins. Um, and that's sort of how I separate CNAP, ASPM and uh, the CADR thing that I think is emerging. Um, but that's my opinion and a lot of it is I think going to still be driven by um, this CNAP need to check every feature checkbox. Um, so I don't think that's going to go away. I just think it's going to keep churning along uh, in the background. Yeah, I mean, so speaking of sort of, you know, uh, churning along, um, you know, uh, over the years, uh, we've done multiple shows on, uh, wellness and mental health and things like that. And, you know, uh, how would you assess uh, kind of the state of the cybersecurity, you know, uh, people and, and this notion of churning, you know, and, and how, how what, what counsel would you give to, to our audience um, to help prevent burnout? Yeah, it's, um, I had a really impactful learning experience from, uh, I thought the main issue with like the security to non-security practitioner ratio, where it's usually like a hundred to one or something. Um, I thought the main issue was like funding for security. And I remember when we got approval to hire another like AppSec person, I thought I was going to like announce it to the team and I would be flooded with people who like wanted to join the AppSec team. And instead I had to basically like beg one developer to join our team before the he wow. finally did. Um, and I think it speaks to uh, that we don't like, that's the skills shortage in action um, is uh, there's, there has to be a recognition from people that security is going to always be a smaller team than the rest of the organization. And I think that that should drive like the way that executives bring empathy to the security team is realizing like, Hey, this is like five people out of like 5,000 developers. Like, let's try to like help them. Um, and the other piece of that is, is a lot of that help should come, um, from different vendor relationships on the tooling side to try to make things easier from like a, how do you even distribute as a five person team vulnerability findings to 5,000 developers? Um, like that's it. That if your expectation is uh, perfection, which I think a lot of security people can struggle with, this idea of like, I should create the perfect system to deal with this, like that's not going to be realistic and you can't live in like this fear of getting a breach because things aren't perfect. 
Um, instead, it has to be this like constantly evolving process. Yeah, indeed. And, you know, so speaking of educating, uh, you know, folks and uh, filling the gap, you know, how would you uh, teach a SOC how to how to handle cloud alerts? Yeah, uh, I think a lot of that upskill has to do with doing like hands on, uh, not just focusing on like the alerts themselves, which is what would be sort of intuitive is like, here's how to respond to this kind of alert versus this kind of alert. But instead teaching that, like having the DevOps team come in and teach like, here's Kubernetes and here's how we manage it. And here's the tools we use. And like, not just showing them, but also like getting the tools installed yourself so that you can go and like actually manage pods and containers and actually like make a change in Terraform, like uh, giving, giving security people up and down the seniority chain, the hands-on ability to make changes is the only way that they're gonna learn this stuff. Um, and so it's about that sort of education that's more holistic than just when you see an alert that says Terraform, here's the team to send it to. Yeah. And and so, you know, speaking of teams, you know, what about, what are your thoughts about, um, you know, agentless uh, cloud detection and response? What does that look like? Yeah, that's, I think uh, um, a lot of the workload layer visibility is important for telling that story together in the, in the same place where, um, if, if you take a pure agentless approach, it's hard to tell the whole story to someone, um, cause they're only looking at like cloud layer attacks. Uh, but it's really about being the, the way that I usually say a lot of teams are afraid to install agents, but I think it's better if you can flip that as looking at the agent installation process as an opportunity, um, because it's an opportunity for you to get involved and learn how things work. And so you should actually like go out of your way to look for a solution that has those sorts of things um, so that it's a way that you can learn the process as you're deploying it, as opposed to wanting this mythical thing that just sort of magically uh, does everything. Yeah, uh, indeed. So, um, and, and by the way, I, I would love to talk to you offline about this concept of agent versus agent list, because I obviously hearing a lot about that. Um, so, um, on behalf of a uh, grateful digital universe um, to um, our three participants, Yal, Ben, and James, uh, I'll just say thank you so much for who you are and for what you do, and most importantly, you know why you do it. And um, I mean that on a very personal, but also on a on a professional uh, level. We cannot. Um, but the criminals win. It's just not acceptable. And and so, any closing thoughts uh, from anyone? 